Hey, this is Pastor Jerry at Crestview Wesleyan in Ashboro, North Carolina. I want to thank you for joining us for this online service. I just want to start out with a great announcement. Next Sunday, which is March the 7th, uh, we will be regathering again at Crestview Wesleyan Church here in Ashboro. So we welcome you. If you've been watching us online and you live uh, around the Ashboro area and you don't attend a church anywhere, we would love for you to join us. At 945, we have our Sunday school that's going to be in our sanctuary. And also at 1045, we'll be in our sanctuary also. We will be having our worship service. Now, we will be asking people to still uh, socially distance and to wear masks. But um, it's just a great time of us coming back together. It's something I've been looking so forward to. And, and this one here feels different with us coming back. I really sense that this is the one where we come back and stay back. So I'm, I'm so excited about seeing our church family again, and I hope uh, some of you will join us next week. We are, we are so looking forward to this. So let me just get into the message today, because I've been, I've been talking about uh, the, the last few weeks about one is, is what it takes to be saved and what that really means. And then uh, the next part of what I'm talking about is, is well, what does God expect of us as Christians? And I'm going to be continuing that today. But as I was thinking about salvation and, and what happens when we give our lives to God, have you, have you ever thought about it? What that, what that really does, what we really receive as, as Christians when we, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, what happens instantaneously? I've talked about a few of those things, but but I just wrote some things down. There's some Bible words that goes along with it. Maybe if you've read your Bible, you've read through it, and you go, well, I'm not really sure what that means. It's a, it's a Bible word, and I read it, but I'm not really sure what that means. Well, let me, let me spell some of these things out that happens the moment we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. The first thing, well, not really. The first thing, all this happens like, all this happens at once. The first thing is we're, we're redeemed. Or the first thing I got written down is we're redeemed. We are, we are freed from the penalty of sin, this death penalty. Because Jesus, he paid the ultimate price for our sin. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail as, as I move on in the message today. Another thing that happens is we are justified. The just judge... The God Almighty has declared us innocent because Jesus, the perfect one, the perfect sacrifice, the only one, has taken on our sin. See, the, the wrath of God that should have been poured out amongst us that we should have taken, that we should have received, was now placed upon Jesus. And Jesus willingly, willingly accepted the wrath that should have been poured out upon us. We should praise the Lord for that, people. The next thing is, another Bible word is, we are reconciled with God. So what that means is the hostility between us and God has ended. See, this sin that, that is in us has created this great divide between us and God. And because of that great divide, because of our sin, we should have deserved the wrath of God. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, we now have been reconciled with God. Now all of that has, has mended together in, in the hostility that we should have or should be happening between us and God has now ended when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Going along with that, we have been adopted into the kingdom. We are now part of the, the family of God. See, th think about this. And, and we hear all of us, all of humanity is made in the image of God. We all have that in common between all of humanity. But when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior... We are given this incredible gift. Now we are part of the family. Now we are a child of the king. Do you understand that? That is a, that is a big difference. Everyone 
is, is made in the image of God. We are all made in the image of God. We are all important to God. Understand that. But when we accept Jesus, we have now been adopted into the family. We are, are now children of God. Get that. And, and see here, it, it goes even further. You know, thinking about this, the, the just judge, God Almighty, has, has slapped down the gavel and declared us innocent, but he has done more than that as the just judge. After we have been declared innocent, think about this. God has invited us to eat dinner with him. He, is, he has now accepted us as part of the family. Isn't that just a, a wonderful thought? That's what happens when we give our life to Christ. And, and there's a, a couple more things that I can think of that happens the moment we get saved. The moment we, we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Uh, another thing, another Bible word is we are sanctified. This is uh, the beginning of, of God making us more Christ-like. It's, uh, a word for that is initial sanctification. We're, we're moving more and more. God is helping us to be more and more like Christ. And, and the last thing that I can think of, and you know there may be more. If there is, let me know. Cause I, but, but these are just incredible, right? The last thing that, that I can think of is that the Spirit of God, it's like God himself. It's like Jesus living, is now living within us. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He, his Spirit comes inside of us and, and to continue this journey toward Christ. And, and just a simple fact Without the Spirit of God living inside of us, it, it is impossible to move forward. So, so I've talked about all of these things, and you've seen them on the screen, and maybe you've, you've written them down or are going to write them down later because these are important Bible words, and I just wanted to just make uh, simple definitions of all of them. But, but get this, people that are watching me today, do you, do you understand the sacrifice that, that Jesus, what he did to get us all of these wonderful benefits, that we receive all of this stuff, we should never take this lightly, our, our salvation lightly, and just kind of blow it off. Okay, I did this. Let's move on with life. Jesus sacrificed everything for you. He willingly came from heaven, the glory of heaven. He came to this messed up earth. And he came as a human. He came willingly to die for us, to die for you and for me. He did that. So we should never take our salvation and what Jesus did lightly. We need to understand that. So let's, let's move on a little bit further today because sadly, sadly, there, there's Christians that when they get saved, that is, that is as far as they want to go. They, they don't want to go any further than initial salvation. They don't want to, they don't want to change any at all. That it's like, you know what, I've got saved and, and I'm just going to kick back and wait for the rest of my, rest of my days. They think that the, the initial sanctification is, is the end. They think that the beginning is the end. And no, that's, that's not true. It's, it's just the beginning. And, and see, a, a, another thing, too, that, that, that just helps us that we need to understand is when, when all of these things happen instantaneously, it, it, to, to know that there's evidence that you're really saved, that you really accepted this, I, I believe there's two things that will happen right away. It, it, may, not, it may not be a full thing, but there'll be a, a movement toward this. We'll have an increased love for God and increased love for others. We, we will start really developing this fruit of the Spirit that it talks about in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. This, this love, this joy, this patience, this kindness, this self-control, and, and there's several others. These things here will really start growing and really start developing, really start, as I said last week, really start ripening. So do I know if I'm really saved? Well, you'll see some of this evidence, right? Even when you're initially saved, that some of this stuff will start changing. It hasn't ripened yet, and it is ripening, but, but some of these things will change. So, okay, what does God expect of us as Christians? That's going to be my topic at least for a couple more weeks. 
let's go to some of the most important scripture in all of the Bible that, that a lot of people who have read the Bible knows about. And it's from Romans chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to that. And, and Romans, as, I, as I've talked about before, it is, it is Paul's theological masterpiece. And the first 11 chapters just really spell out, really get into deep theology about how that, that, that we have this inescapable situation that we're in because of sin, that there's no way that we can get out of it. We can't be good enough. There's nothing we can do to get out of this predicament, this terrible predicament that we're in. But it also explains in the first 11 chapters of Romans that, that it's Jesus. It's Jesus that makes us right before God. It's Jesus' blood. It's Jesus' sacrifice that has saved us. And, and it, it just spells this out in the first 11 chapters. And, and it's a lot theological that goes on in these first 11 chapters. And then Paul, after this deep theological talk, he moves into chapter 12 where it, he comes into the practical part. He says, okay, you, you see the theological part. Now, starting in chapter 12, this is what is expected of a Christian. So let's follow along with this. And I'm going to talk about Romans chapter 12 for, for a few minutes, but this is just awesome stuff from Paul. So the first 11 chapters are theological and then he gets to chapter 12 verse 1 and he says this, Therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy uh, mercy simply means God withholding something that we absolutely deserve. We deserve death. We deserve the wrath of God but because of his mercy and because of what Jesus did he's withheld it to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Verse 1, Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. If you read any of Paul's letters, you read Romans, you read several of his letters that he wrote in the New Testament, he uses Old Testament terminology to explain his point, to make his point clearer. And he talks about here a sacrifice, a, a living sacrifice. And, and this terminology sacrifice comes from the Old Testament, right? Because in the Old Testament, the, the Jewish people, the Israelites, were required to make sacrifices. They were to get a, a lamb. They were to get something that was a, a bull that was di didn't find any defect on it at all, and they would sacrifice it. They would kill it. They would put it to death and use this blood to, to sprinkle over to, to atone, to get rid of people's sins. And, and think about this too. Uh, if, if those of you maybe already be thinking about this, that, that, that once a year that in the temple and, and in, in the tabernacle before then, where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the, the Ark of the Covenant was, was more or less where the presence of God resided, that, that on, on the cover there, on the top of the ark where the angel's wings are, there's this, this cover. And it's called, uh, a couple of terms, it's called the mercy seat. And it's also called the atonement cover. So what the, the high priest would do once a, a year on atonement day is he would go in there and he would have the, the blood from a, a perfect animal, perfect sheep, and he would take the blood of that animal and sprinkle it over the atonement cover. And, and what it would do would be to, to get rid of our sins, to cover our sins, to cover the Jewish people's sins. And see, that's the terminology that, that Paul is using here today that helps us think about it. But, but we are called to be living sacrifices. We, 
You and I as believers in Christ are called to be a living sacrifice. So, so what, does that, what does that mean? Well, I've been uh, reading this book from Keith Drury. It is Holiness for Ordinary People. I'm using a lot of the the messages I'm using. I'm I've read through that, and I'm using some of some of his information. That's a great book to read, if you don't, if you haven't read it. It'll help you understand a lot of things about what I'm talking about here these next few weeks. But but he had this great definition of what this means, what a living sacrifice really is. L- listen to this. He says that that this is not a physical death. This living sacrifice but a death of self-centeredness. It's a once and for all sacrifice, yet it's a continual sacrifice, which that is a living sacrifice as well. Just like a man or a woman woman offering up their lamb to God, they kiss it goodbye. I offer myself completely to God, kissing my selfishness goodbye. So this living sacrifice it goes further than a sacrifice of sometimes in churches we say a sacrifice of of prayer sometimes we say a, a sacrifice of of service uh, sometimes when we think of sacrifice uh, a sacrificial offering like a, like a tithe or money or or some kind of, of gift to the church or gift to God See, Paul talks about even deeper than that, even more than that. So there's a, another quote here that, that, I'd, that I've got, and it's is from uh, one of my commentaries. It said, this living sacrifice is not only what we can give that God demands. He, he demands the giver. We, we are to be the living sacrifice. So what happens, another thing that happens when we except Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the old self has died. Died means it's gone. It can't come back to life anymore. It's gone. We now have the new self. In John chapter 3, it talks about, uh, Jesus talks about this as being born again. So we have this, we have this new self. We, we are now a living sacrifice. And what God requires is, is not... Just our service and our, our giving and our praise. He, he, he wants all of us for us to be a living sacrifice. That's what God accepts and requires of us as Christians. Do you hear that? It's more than just words. It's, it's living our life. It's more than what we do. It's living our life. It's giving our life to God in service to Him. So then we go on to the verse 2 here. In, in the way that we can truly offer our bodies, offer all of us to God, is not to conform to the patterns of this world. So this world means the sin-dominated world that we live in. This, uh, this death world that we live in, this death-producing world that, that all of us live in, we naturally live in. So Paul explains that, that offering our bodies is living sacrifice. He goes into more detail in this in, in some of the previous chapters. Like in, in Romans chapter 6, see if this here doesn't really put a bow on what, what this talks about when he's, he's talking about not conforming to the patterns of this world. Chapter 6 goes into more details. Listen to this. He says, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is what the living sacrifice is all about. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. (coughs) Excuse me. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself, which that's your complete self. That's, that is all of it. That's the living sacrifice to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, 
but you are under not under the law but you are under grace do not conform to the patterns of this world this sin dominated this death producing world but then he goes on to the second part is well well before i get to that let's let's just be honest here for a second even though we are are we have been graciously giving we have graciously received this new realm we we ha now have the new self we are now have this new realm that that Christ has so graciously died on the cross for and we've received we we're still living in this fallen world right and, and we are still fallen people so i don't want to give this this understanding or this thought that you know everything is going to be perfect after we accept jesus as our lord and savior no we we are still living in this fallen world and we are still fallen people but but as we live we have this spirit that is in us that, that we are now it, it indwells in us but now we are yielding to it we're listening more to the spirit that that we can more easily resist the pressure of being squeezed into this world this conforming to this world with the spirit working through us we, we're no longer have that we we're no longer squeezed into the world listen we will never be perfectly sin free until we reach this glory in heaven you understand that right i mean scripture makes that clear that that we still are fallen people living in a fallen world we're gonna we're gonna mess up but here's the thing, but as we grow more and more into Christ's likeness, when we yield more and more to the Spirit, that's what we as Christians are expected to do. It's a lot more than just initially accepting what Jesus did. We are called to continue growing. That's what Romans 1 and 2 is all about, right? We continue growing in Christ's likeness. Another word for that that I'm going to get more into here in the next few messages is holiness, Christ-likeness. We get more and more into Christ-likeness. The sin that used to be dominant, that used to be right here in front of us, that used to be just hounding us all the time, is now as we see, as we're growing more and more toward Christ, this sin right here is going further and further in our rearview mirror. It doesn't go away. But see, it goes further and further and further back. So it, it, it's not dominating us anymore. We don't have to conform this way. The Spirit can help us. There will be fewer and fewer self-inflicted wounds in our lives. I mean, we, we should, because of us being fallen people, we, we've messed up, right? We've, we've turned against God. We, we have willfully sinned. But as we grow more and more toward Christ and this sin goes more and more back, you will notice, you better start noticing that there'll be less and less self-inflicted wounds. There'll be less and less scars. Right? That's what, that's what Scripture's teaching. We are moving more and more toward Christ. More and more, the Bible word is, is holiness. So we, we are not to conform to the patterns of this sin-dominated world, but we are to be transformed, this second verse, transformed by the renewing of our minds. So, so transformed is, is like a, a complete change. It's like a, it's like a, a worm that, that turns into a beautiful butterfly. It's a complete change, a metamorphosis. We are going to be transformed by the renewing of our mind so uh, a renewing is is simply a continual process we are moving more and more toward christ likeness do you get that i'm repeating this over and over we are growing more and more toward christ likeness we are maturing we're growing he's helping us we're yielding more and more to the spirit so as we grow and grow 
more that way. We can renew our minds. We can reprogram our minds so that our focus is more on God and, and less on sin. That's our Christian. That is our appropriate and expected response as a, as a believer in Christ. Romans chapter 8 is one of my favorite books in all the Bible. I got, there's a lot of good chapters in Romans, but Romans chapter 8 is just awesome because that talks about what a new believer in Christ, what a believer in Christ should look like, a spirit-filled believer should look like. And in, in verse 8, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 5, it just speaks about what I've been talking about. Pay attention to this. It says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit, this new self, have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind is governed by the mind governed by the flesh is death. It's the old way, it's the old self. It's, it's the way before Christ. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Man, there's so many people looking for life and peace today. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. So scripture confirms to us the point that because of us renewing our minds, we can get to the point of, of where our focus is only on pleasing God. If you got to that yet, have you ever considered that, that? That because of us renewing our minds, growing in Christ, focusing on, on God's word, that's how God speaks to us is through prayer and through his, his word and through other believers. It, when, and that's part of renewing our mind. We can get to the point of where what what we think about what we're doing is only about pleasing God in, in each and every situation. See, see, church, we can live the victorious life. We don't have to live this choppy life where things are always up and down and, oh, I'm far away from God, I'm back to Him. I mean, we, we all see social media where, where people who... Who, who, who are Christians who in one moment are, are sending some scriptures and the next moment cussing out somebody else on. See, that's, 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 not, that's not an abundant Christian life, right? That's, that's a, a choppy life. That is a defeated life. God tells us that our appropriate and expected response is to not conform to this world, not conform to all the things society is trying to tell us or teach us, to be transformed, totally changed by the renewing of our minds. And that's something that the Spirit of God can do. That's something that reading God's Word and understanding it through the Spirit will do. From praying to God, from being around other Christians. That's why I'm so excited about us meeting next week. We're going to be back together again. It's so important. We need to do that. We can live a victorious life. So let me ask you, is that you? Is that you? I, I hope these messages here, maybe some of you who are watching it says, you know what, I just, I, just think, I just thought the Christian life is just accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior and just waiting till my, my time to leave this earth and go to heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us that we are to, to grow, that we are not supposed to be like this world, that we are supposed to be like God and, and be transformed and continue to grow toward Him, toward holiness, toward Christ-likeness. Man, there's still some more good messages. I hadn't even got to the good stuff yet. And I think this is awesome. So anyway, God bless you. I and mean, I, I hope you'll consider joining us next week. And, and things are getting better. And man, I'm just so excited about seeing everybody. I'm telling you, I can't wait. God bless you. Let's... Let's keep working to be more like Christ. More like Christ. Because that is our expected and our appropriate response to what Jesus has done for us. God bless you. Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your word and how it teaches us. Lord, I pray that if there's some here today that, that maybe have given their their lives to you many years ago that, that accepted you as Lord and Savior, but Lord has, has not really changed since then, that it's just kind of kicking back, that, that Lord, that you will prod them, that you will work in their hearts to to be more like you, that they will understand, Lord, that it's this more than the things that they do, but Lord, is that you want us to be a living sacrifice, that Lord, you want all of us, and Lord, help us to be willing to give all of our lives to you, to be changed by you, and to continue to be changed by you. Bless in each, each and every one. Lord, we thank you, Lord, how you're keeping us and how you're helping us. Lord, a special blessings on each and every one that's watching today, their lives, their family, their health, their jobs, everything, Lord. We, we just praise you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.